evening and welcome to the Morgan Library and Museum. I am Isabel Dervaux, the Aquavilla Curator and um, Department Head of the Modern and Contemporary Drawings. It's a pleasure to introduce tonight's program uh, during which Niklaus Manuel Gudel will give a lecture entitled Ferdinand Hodler and Mark Rothko, A Passion for the Italian Renaissance. In conjunction with the exhibition Ferdinand Hodler Drawings, Selections from the Musée Yoniche Vevey, which is on view in our galleries through October 1st. Before introducing Mr. Goodall, I would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Consulate General of Switzerland in New York for tonight's program. We are honored to be joined this evening by Ambassador Nicoline Yeager, Consul General, Consul General of Switzerland in New York. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Yeager to the podium to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight and to see a wonderful co collaboration between the, the Morgan uh, Museum and Library and the Musee Jenisch in Vevey, Switzerland. It is great also to welcome you, our special guest, Niklaus. Uh, thank you for coming. Niklaus is the director of the Ferdinand Hodler Institute. But foremost, I want to thank Isabel and her team for the wonderful work that we are seeing tonight at the gallery, but also we will hear more about from, from Niklaus. As you know, Ferdinand Hodler is ingrained in our Swiss culture and also the perception of Niklaus Hodler. And I think I'm not the only one that has discovered tonight Hodler with different eyes thanks to this exhibition that shows us the drawings. In Switzerland, Hodler is mostly known through the landscape paintings, the paintings of knights, the paintings of workers. But here in New York, and thanks to your collaboration, we can discover another Hodler, the Hodler of drawings. And I think you read about it. We see also the reunification of two paintings that have been apart for over a hundred years. Um, I think only recently it was discovered that these two paintings were cut in two by Hodler himself. One painting remained in Switzerland, one painting went to Detroit, and for the first time they are united again after more than a hundred years. I want to thank you for your attention, and I want to give the floor back to Isabella for the introduction of Niklaus Manuel Gödel. Enjoy the evening, thank you. Uh, Niklaus Gödel is the director of the Ferdinand Hodler Institute in Geneva in Switzerland. He is an art historian, a curator, and an artist. From 2009 to 2014, he directed the journal Les Lettres et les Arts. And he was one of the founders of Swiss Notebooks of Literary and Artistic Criticism. A specialist of Ferdinand Hodler and Gustave Courbet, Niklaus Gudel is the author of numerous publications and exhibitions on these two artists. He produced the first scholarly edition of The Artist's Mission, which was an important lecture delivered by Hodler in 1897. And together with Diana Blom, Niklaus Gudel has also published Hodler's writings about art, and he has edited his complete correspondence. As president of the Swiss Society for the Study of Gustave Courbet, Niklaus Gudel led the project to re-examine the French painter's graphic work and has published a study of his landscapes in 2019. Niklaus Gudel studied at the universities of Basel and Neuchâtel. He is currently preparing a doctoral thesis at the University of Lausanne on Hodler's interest in the Italian primitives, Giotto in particular, a research from which he derived the subject of tonight's lecture. Please join me in welcoming Niklaus Manuel Gudel. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let me start by thanking Isabel Dervaux, curator of the Holler exhibition, for inviting me here today to give this lecture. 
I would also like to thank Christopher Rothko for honoring us with his presence this evening and for generously answering my questions in the preparation for this lecture. The subject of my presentation was inspired by a visit to the Fondation Bayeler in Rien, near Basel in Switzerland in 2019. The museum had just received a major collection of impressionist and modern art as part of a long-term loan from Swiss businessman Rudolf Stechelin, which included several leading hodlers. To celebrate the arriv arrival of, the collect of this collection, the Fondation Bayeler chose to hang the pieces alongside significant works from its own permanent collection, which includes paintings by Mark Rothko. The exhibition featured works by Hodler, including the landscape of Lake Geneva, known as Le Léman au Nuage Rose, which you can see in this photograph of the exhibition. This is one of 17 landscapes Hodler painted during the last six months of his life and was made from the balcony of his apartment in Geneva. Also included in the exhibition was the portrait de Valentine Godet d'Arel sur son lit de mort, depicting the painter's mistress the day after her death, where she appears weightless or suspended between two color planes. At first glance, these juxtapositions didn't make sense to me. I mean that there is no historical reason to compare Hodler's work with that of Rothko. I was slightly taken aback by this bold association, and at the same time, I was intrigued by the way those works complemented each other. So I kept on reflecting about that unexpected resonance and tried to put together some explanations which I propose to discuss with you today. Let us start with a few factual considerations in order to clear up any misunderstanding. The first one is quite obvious. Hodler and Rothko never met. When Ferdinand Hodler died in Geneva in 1918, aged 65, Mark Rothko was just 15 and living in Portland. The only thing that Hodler's and Rothko's biographies have in common is that they both had their first contact with the United States in 1913. Mark Rothko was 10 and still went by the name Markus Rotkowitz, had just left Latvia and emigrated to the United States with his mother and sister. They joined his father, who had left three years earlier and settled in Portland. Hodler had just celebrated his 60th birthday and was then considered one of the most sought after artists in Europe. Hodler, who had never traveled to the United States, exhibited two paintings at the Armory Show that year. A landscape of the Nizen, a mountain in the Bernese Alps near his childhood home, and a two-figure version of L'Heure Sacrée. While it's obvious that Hodler never saw a work by Rothko, it's not impossible that Rothko may have seen a painting by Hodler. After the First World War, Hodler went through a period where he was widely forgotten, and it was not until the early 1970s that he was rediscovered internationally. The first major retrospective of his work in the United States was an exhibition that began in 1973 and traveled from the UC Berkeley Art Museum to the Guggenheim and the Bush Reisinger Museum at Harvard University. But Rothko had passed away three years earlier. However, the exhibition was organized by art historian Peter Zeltz, who had likewise conceived the first retrospective of Roscoe's work at the Museum of Modern Art in 1961. Despite regular exhibitions, Hodler was poorly represented in American public collections for a long time. For instance, the Metropolitan Museum 
only acquired its first hodler, Le Songe du Berger, in 2013. The exception being the Art Institute of Chicago that has included several of the artist's paintings in its permanent exhibition since 1926. However, despite Rothko exhibiting at the museum in 1954, he did not attend the show, so it's unclear whether he was aware of the existence of those works. While Rothko traveled three times to Europe, visiting various monuments and museums in 1950, 59, and 66, he made no stopovers in Switzerland, Austria, or Germany, the countries where Hodler was best represented in public collections. In addition, there were no Hodler exhibitions in the cities visited in Italy, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, or England. Therefore, the most likely opportunity would have been the first solo exhibition dedicated to Ferdinand Hodler in the United States at the Durand Ruel Galleries in New York in May 1940. Although it only displayed 21 paintings, the media, particularly the New York Times, praised the quality of the selected works. This view of Lake Geneva, for example, was included in the show. Not being able to establish a more direct link is convenient because what clearly makes Rothko's and Hodler's paintings resonate goes beyond the notion of a historical link and reaches an artistic vision based on their knowledge of the past and their conception of painting as a philosophy. Hodler and Rothko have another surprising thing in common. They are both admirers of Italian art, particularly Giotto and Fra Angelico. Hodler and Rothko drew not only models, but also a veritable state of mind, which led Rothko to say, I'm a Renaissance man. Hodler could have claimed the same, and I, and I, and I think that is where the shared feeling in their works comes from. Of course, both artists sometimes consciously worked with a model in mind. Consider Roscoe's reformulation of Botticelli's Birth of Venus, whose composition he translated into a surrealist vocabulary in 1944 when he painted Slow Swirl at the Edge of the Sea. Rothko had not only seen Botticelli's painting in books, but also for real at the Museum of Modern Art in 1940 during a major exhibition about the Italian uh, old masters. Hodler's, Hodler's work also comes with numerous examples where one can feel the weight of tradition. The layered composition of Le Songe du Berger and the division in two narrative spaces seem inspired by a painting in the Prado that the young Hodler studied extensively. It's a version of Raphael's Transfiguration by his students Giovanni Francesco Penny and Giulio Romano. However, those iconographical similarities are anecdotal in comparison with the general sentiment. They merely demonstrate both artists' interest in the old masters. What is of higher interest goes beyond copying, modeling, appropriation, or even influence. By the way, the latter is ill-adapted when it comes to art history. It is much rather about reformulating, recreating, and reinventing. In the artist's reality, Rothko rightly develops the idea that the modern artist has traveled through all of man's plastic experience. Armed with this knowledge, he provides for us of this age the language for our reapprehension of the whole world of art in language and terms commensurate with our present knowledge and understanding. Rothko himself would sometimes agree to reveal sources in greater detail or to recognize a kind of matrix for his work, work in ancient art, what he would call unconscious sources. Moreover, Hodler 
added that man can make nothing out of nothing. When the artist makes a work, he borrows its element from an already existing world in the midst of which he lives. According to his son Christopher, Rothko was explicitly a painter of ideas, as he used to repeat. Painting was the means, the system, for communicating his thoughts in a non-verbal way, confronting visitors with fundamental human emotions. Painting nourishes a unified thought in search of a permanent symbol. That aspiration echoes perfectly with Hodler, who said, I live to realize an idea, and whose artistic quest was about a unitary vision, the highlighting of a universal law in nature. A year after having articulated his principle of composition, Hodler read Leo Tolstoy's essay, What is Art?, which sees art as a universal means of communication, comparing it with music. Hodler read the book several times, and, share, and shared his ideas with his son, Hector. For his part, Hector had got committed to the constructed auxiliary language, Esperanto, a universal language conceived to foster international exchanges and in a spirit of harmony and pacifism. Being a compositional principle designed to reveal the unity and harmony of nature, Hodler's parallelism somehow pursues the same objectives than Esperanto. Hodler first presented his artistic theory in La Mission de l'Artiste, a lecture delivered in 1897. Parallelism is defined as expressing the super, supreme order of nature through similar or symmetrical elements within a composition. This translates into the repetition of shapes, lines, colors, of, or motives with the goal of expressing this universal law of harmony. According to the master, le lac de Thun au reflet symétrique is the landscape where Hodler best expressed his principle with the, reflection, uh, with the reflections of the mountains in the water, the left and right symmetry, the repetition of the highly calculated shapes of the clouds, and even the ripples in the foreground. His principle is applicable to all his works and explains the often very simple and yet rigorous compositional choices through which he seeks to demonstrate his ideal of unity in nature and equality between men. For painting to fulfill the function of communicating ideas, it must be governed by a system, like architecture, language, or music. Parallelism is such a system. Rothko did also reflect on a governing system for his compositions, as the repeated sketches in Rothko's composition book indicate. One of the points of convergence between Hodler and Rothko lies in their interest in architecture as a constructive system. It is striking to note that what impressed both of them most during their respective trips to Italy were the ar architectural monuments. They shared a real obsession with structure, composition, and the human scale. Hodler was an avid reader of Renaissance treatises, and as a young man, he read Vitruvius' De Architectura, a treatise in which Vitruvius conceives architecture as both an imitation of nature and a, and a science based on the human scale. The famous Vitruvian man, illustrated in the third book of the treatise, explains how human proportions can be translated geometrically. During the Renaissance, man became the focus of attention, inspiring reflections on his place in the world and its representation. The human scale even served as a basis for architectural projects, as illustrated by drawings by Francesco di Giorgio Martini, da Vinci's master, 
in which human anatomy shapes the layout of a church or in which the proportions of the head serve as a matrix for the decoration of an entablature. Rothko also pondered the notion of the human scale. As demonstrated by a number of drawings in his composition book, notably this one, which using the Vitruvian man as a schema, shows a formal research for his classical period paintings and hinges on a reflection of man's place in front of a painting. The human scale was also fundamental in determining the size of his paintings. The architectural ambition that underpinned his work led him to conceive the layout of his canvases in an almost mathematical way, truly staging the experience he seeked to offer to the viewer. Hodler, for his part, was familiar with classical architecture and produced several large frescoes, including the one, the one that established his reputation in Switzerland and Europe, the famous Retraite de Marignan. For this project, he went so far as to execute it literally in fresco, just like in the Renaissance, whereas his older murals are actually painted on canvas in the studio, then glued to the wall. The idea of architectural is deeply rooted in Hodler, not only because he sees painting as a means of expressing the order of, the order of nature, but also because he often sets it up at, as an example of his artistic principle. The importance of architecture is undeniable in the development of the theory of parallelism. He is quoted as saying, the idea of parallelism came to me when I began to study the masterpieces of architecture. And when asking myself why ancient constructions give us such an equal, harmonious, grandiose impression, I come to answer because the equivalent parts are arranged in a certain calculated order. What seems to have interested Hodler most are the colonnades, which for him clearly evoke the parallelism of forests, which he used as an example for his theory. If I go for a walk in a forest, of very high fir trees, I can see ahead of me, to the right and to the left, the innumerable columns formed by the same vertical line repeated an infinite number of times. The main note causing that impression of unity is the parallelism of the trunks. In his lecture, La Mission de l'Artiste, he also refers to the Parthenon frieze where he appreciates the repetition of the figures. In his painting Eurythmie, he arranged five similar figures with the idea of expressing a common state of mind. About this painting, he explains, the painting depicts five old men, all roughly in profile and all draped in white cloaks. They are walking along a rocky path with dead leaves in the fog, a forced march towards the same end, destiny. It is the season of death. Each individual is very different in physiognomy, but, is the same state, but it is the same state of mind that makes the five bodies move with a regular motion, a slow melancholy march. The unity of this disposition is marched by the unity and repetition of the forms. The five bodies all appear like architectural monuments. In many of his paintings, Hodler goes back to the idea of figures arranged on the same plane, set side by side like columns supporting the picture. It is also the case in his last monumental painting, Regard dans l'infini, for which several preparatory studies are displayed in the exhibition. In 1911, on his second trip to Italy, Hodler would turn to architecture to find a practical solution to one of his current problems. 
Hodler had recently received the commission to paint a large-scale mural for the new town hall in Hanover, Germany. It was to depict a historical event, the moment when the citizens of Hanover adopted the doctrine of the Reformation. The subject suited him perfectly since it was to represent the unity of the citizens in this decision. Hodler's compositional parameters lent themselves well to the exercise. He therefore started using the colonnade principle to depict citizens raising their arms in accretions. He then pla placed them in a linear fashion with a speaker at the center, the one who is convincing them to approve this new order. The problem with this solution is that the group is split in two and thus does not sufficiently express the idea of unanimity. Hodler had to take an architectural constraint in consideration. The lintel of the door split the painting surface in two halves and forced him to use it as a platform for the speaker. At the time he was facing this problem, Hodler was in Rome for the inauguration of the International Exhibition of Fine Arts where he exhibited Le Bûcheron and a cartoon for La Retraite de Marignan. On this occasion, he visited St. Peter's Square in the Vatican, which seems to have made a strong impression on, me, on him. In any case, he sent several postcards of Gian Lorenzo Bernini's quadruple colonnade, which arcs around the Egyptian obelisk. The arched arrangement around the central element inspired Hodler to depict a double row of citizens with out, outstretched arms arranged in a circle around the speaker with just one opening on the central figure. He sketched out this solution in the notebook he carried with him to Rome and affirms this architectural source as the origin for the final composition of his mural. Here the mural again. Rothko does not seem to have been insensitive to colonnades either, according to the account of John Fisher, who quoted him as saying, on course of a picnic on the site of Paestum, opposite to the temple of Hera, I have, I have been seeing, excuse me, I have been painting Greek temples all my life without knowing it. On his third trip to Italy in 1966, Rothko took his daughter Kate to Florence to show her the Laurentian Library, in particular the vestibule designed by Michelangelo, which had been his inspiration for the Seagram murals. Rothko told John Fisher, after I had been at work for some time, I realized that I was much influenced subconsciously by Michelangelo's walls in the staircase room of the Medician Library in Florence. He achieved just the kind of feeling I'm after. He makes the viewer feel that they are trapped in a room where all the doors and windows are bricked up so that all they can do is butt their heads forever against the wall. It is undeniable, looking at the architectural forms, that similar shapes can be found in most of Seagram's murals. Unlike the other paintings of this period, which are characterized by juxtaposed colored surfaces, usually rectangular or elongated, the Seagram murals feature surfaces to which Rothko gives more explicit forms, effectively bringing to mind windows, frames, or doors. Rothko used this vocabulary in a lecture at the Pratt Institute in October 1958, just after he received the commission to paint the Seagram murals. My pictures are indeed facades, 
Sometimes I'm open one door and one window, or, or two doors and two windows. Following Rothko's instructions, the first exhibition space of this ensemble at Long London State Gallery respects the architectural idea of a narrow framed room like the vestibule of the Laurentian Library, which fostered the senses of oppression Rothko wanted visitors to feel. With the Seagram murals, however, we are still in a dy dynam dynamics where architectural inspiration provides pictorial solutions, which remain within the realm of painting and scenography, because the final destination of these works was not known at the time he conceived them. Oppositely, when he created in the 1960s the paintings for what has become the Rothko Chapel, he knew the destination and the symbolism of the paintings he was working on, a sacred space. With this project, his architectural inspiration took on a more global meaning. Rothko's daughter, Kate, recalls that during a trip to Europe in 1959, much of our time was spent absorbing the architecture in several Italian cities. In particular, he visited Torcello in the Venetian Lagoon, where he discovered the Byzantine Basilica of Santa Maria Assunta and the adjoining church of Santa Fosca. The octagonal-based structure of Santa Fosca is said to be one of the sources of inspiration for the Rothko Chapel. At the time, Rothko had even borrowed several books on Florentine architecture from his friend Herbert Ferber. Moreover, the architecture of the chapel, designed by Rothko himself, as well as the monochromatic works conceived for it, are not only on a human scale, but carry a spiritual dimension. In this way, it echoes the ambition of ancient sacred architecture to offer both a human experience and a building in the image of div divine grandeur, one that would please the gods. When reading the artist's reality, one is struck by the importance of the Italian model. Rothko most often quotes Giotto, but also Botticelli, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and even Giorgio Vasari's Lives of Artists. At this point, it's clear that Rothko had an excellent knowledge of Italian art history, particularly that of the reception of Giotto. I'll come back to this in a, in a, moment, in a moment. Rothko, of course, had ample opportunity to examine these painters, particularly Giotto's frescoes, during his three trips to Europe, all of which included important sojourns in Italy. But like many artists, he was first familiar with their works through books and reproductions. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art, of course, he had the opportunity to see an important collection of Italian art that only contained one small panel by Giotto. What's more, as I previously mentioned, he had the opportunity to see major works at the Italian Masters exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1940, but not Giotto was on display. It is just after that exhibition that Rothko wrote the artist's reality. When it comes to the secret resonances between his work and that of Hodler, I'm particularly interested in his admiration for Giotto, who was Hodler's favorite painter. Until now, research has often focused on the importance of Holbein and Dürer for Hodler, which is indisputable considering the fact that he owned engravings by Dürer and photo photographic reproduction of works by Holbein. This one. In his use, however, he was trained in the tradition of Raphael, who marked a generation of 19th century artists as the absolute model. In particular, Hodler took part in the recomposition exercise that his teacher, Barthélemy Men, 
himself a former pupil of Ingres, used to give to his students. The idea was to take one or more figure, uh, figures, in this example, Aeneas carrying Anchises from the Borg of Fire, and render them from different points of view. Hodler used this technique to borrow motifs from Renaissance works for his own compositions. For instance, in the various sketches for the fresco of La Retraite de Marignan, one finds a soldier carrying a wounded warrior, which seems to be the result of that exercise. Barthélemy Men had also seen Giotto in Italy and was among the first artists to hold him in high esteem. He prob probably talks to his students about his stay in Italy and Giotto frescoes. When Hodler visited the, the Prado in Madrid as a very young person, he had a kind of foresight. In a letter dated November 1878, after commenting on a number of paintings, he said, I think the painter I would like above all, is, above all others is Giotto, but I'll have to go to Italy to see him. At the time, he only knew Giotto through engravings and some paintings in the Louvre. A few years earlier, Van Gogh had also expre expressed his desire to go to Italy to copy him without having seen more. Artists growing interest in Giotto, including Hodler's friend Degas, led art historians to finally take an interest on, in him and to rediscover his work. When Hodler first traveled to Italy in the footsteps of Giotto in 1905, there were only one or two monographs about the painter, not many more. Hodler visited Florence, Assisi, and Padua, discovering Giotto's most important works, which he had previously only known through black and white reproductions. On his return, he told a friend, for a time I too studied Rembrandt, but today Giotto is my man. I saw him recently in Italy. That's nature. Michelangelo is also beautiful with his curved lines, but after him, it's all over. Hodler particularly admired the expressive qualities and the simplicity of the composition of Giotto's works. The notes he took about the main characteristics of Giotto's works show that he was mostly interested in the effects of repetition or symmetry and the order of elements or everything that closely or remotely related to his parallelism idea. In works such as L'Heure Sacrée, one senses the importance of the Italian model, both in the hierarchical arrangement of figures and in the treatment of the layout freed from the problems associated with pers perspective. Hodler was also very interested in the structure of plants and used plant motifs as structuring elements in his paintings. He was familiar with the triumph of death fresco, a detail of which you, you can see here. He had seen it at the Camposanto Monumentale in Pisa in 1905, just before he conceived L'Heure Sacrée. Hodler was also interested in the expressiveness of gesture in Giotto's work and in Italian Renaissance painting in general. Examples abound even the period before his travels to Italy. In 1903, for instance, while hoping to visit Florence, he ended up visiting the Pinacothek in Munich. He made several sketches in his notebooks. If you look closely, you will notice that they are exclusively about Italian paintings and mostly about gestures of annunciation or adoration. For example, he copies the gesture of the crossed arms in Francesco Francia's Madonna in the Rose Garden. That gesture, which took on a religious sense in the Renaissance, finds a secular meaning in Hodler's work though not without a form of transcendental aspiration. 
the gesture becomes an expressing an expression of the shared emotion of the figures or, the, or of the delight provoked by a connection with nature. In Femme en Marche, one can clearly see the role that Hodler's observations at the museum have played. Giotto's painting is characterized by the expressiveness of his figures, which are no longer a succession of figures as in Byzantine art, but a group of individuals where each one is different from its neighbor. Giotto strived to make his biblical scenes credible, close to the reality of his audience, playing on the expressiveness of faces and gestures, seeking to provoke empathy and emotion. Roth Rothko, for his part, tried to obtain the very same effects. He said, I'm interested only in expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on, and the fact that lots of people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures shows that I communicate those basic human emotions. Emotion and expressivity are central to Hodler's work too. He tries to show emotions that are the same for everyone in the face of the great questions of life. Eurythmie, for instance, expresses the melancholy of someone about to die. Other symbolic works evolved in a similar vein, such as Lila de Vivre, about which Hodler said, I just want to show that we are one, that we are united, our uniformity, our likeness. Hodler strives to express a universal feeling. Rothko pursues a similar aim, stating, I'm involved with the human element. I want to create a state of intimacy, an immediate transaction. Large pictures take you into them. Scale is of tremendous importance to me, human scale. When I went to Europe and saw the old masters, I was involved with the credibility of the drama. I think that small pictures since the Renaissance are like novels. Large pictures are like dramas in which one participates in a direct way. However, Hodler, Hodler's and Rothko's interest for Giotto differed in their study of color. Hodler loved blues and had renounced using gold to avoid being compared with the old masters. But above all, it's important to remember that the frescoes in Assisi and Padua were unlit, had yet to be restored to their original color, and were covered in dust at the time he saw them. Hodler even deplored it in his correspondence. Rothko discovered them in an entirely different context, with electric lighting and works that had already been restored. What's more, he had access to a much wider collection of literature of which he had detailed knowledge as the artist's reality proves. In these books, he contrasts the depreciatory opinions of painter Edwin Blashfield, published in Italian cities, with Bernard Berenson's analysis of the tactile value of Giotesque painting in the Florentine painters of the Renaissance. This work made a decisive contribution to the renewed reception of Giotto. While Berenson relies on the recurrent idea of sincerity of expression in Giotto's painting, he takes the question much further, particularly developing the idea of the plasticity of forms, arguing for their clarity, their individual and almost architectural value that give the paintings the evocative power of something real, almost tangible. Referring to Berenson and the example of Giotto, Rothko revisits the plasticity of painting topic, but argues that one can go back further in the past and that Byzantine painters gave color a haptic meaning and value when inlaying precious stones into mosaics. Where Rothko dwells on color, Hodler focuses on contour and composition. Having been a pupil of men and indirectly of Ingres, 
The idea of the primacy of drawing over color was central in his education. That is why he always prioritized the accuracy of the drawing, the quality of contour. In La Mission de l'Artiste, he explains the beauty of the contour line with an Italian example. For me, I know of nothing more beautiful than certain portraits of women by the Italian primitives, which contours are of admirable sharpness. Hodler often returned himself to the drawing of his figures, sometimes even accentuating the lines with Raffaelli sticks, a kind of oil painting in stick form, similar to an oil pastel. He then chooses ustening colors, bright blue, red, sometimes green, to insistently outline the elements, in this case, the drapery, the hands, the outline of the figures. Almost to the end of his career, Hodler does favored form and contour over color. It is precisely in the importance that Rothko gives to color in Giotto's work that one sees the extent to which both artists belong to different centuries. During his visit to the convent of San Marco in Florence, Hodler paid a lot of attention to the composition of the circle around Christ in the scene on Mount Tabor. He even acquired a photographic reproduction of the work, which you can see here. It is the same composition that had triggered his interest in Giotto's Peruzzi Chapel in Florence's Santa Croce Basilica, when he observed the fresco with St. John of Patmos surrounded by symbols of the apocalypse. For his part, Rothko was impressed by Fra Angelico's colors and large flat tints, evoking those unconscious sources that bring us back to the idea that the artist has traveled through all of man's plastic experience. Similarly, he felt a deep affinity between his work and the murals in the House of Mysteries when he visited Pompeii. The same feeling, the same broad expanses of dark color, said he. Robert Motherwell recounted Rothko's admiration for Fra Angelico and how Rothko sought egg-based mediums to achieve similar color effects in light and softness. Rothko also worked with extremely thin layers of color, which was unusual for the 20th century. One can also be surprised by Hodler's technique in which the paint layer is sometimes very thin and other times thicker, applied to linen without primer. This is one of the two paintings Hodler left unfinished at his death. It shows how he painted directly on linen, either with a brush, here the mountains or the sky, or directly with a knife, here the lake. Sometimes, like in this version of Valentin Godet d'Arel sur son lit de mort, he would even use the raw canvas as a colored surface. The whole lower part of the bed is left untouched. The beige color actually is the very color of the canvas. From a technical point of view, Hodler's search for modernity sums up in the path he took to rid himself of Ingres' precept of the dominance of drawing. It was only very late, shortly before his death, that Hodler took a major step that made his last, last landscapes possible. He told one of his friends, more than ever, color not only accompanies form, but brings it to life and shapes it. And this time, it's magnificent. I now hold the great spaces. He had reached a kind of a new height of his work and declared that he no longer wished to paint anything but lake landscapes, landscapes he described as planetary. The testament of Hodler's aesthetic lies in the series of 17 landscapes he, painting, he painted during the last months of his life, varying his viewpoints very little, but giving color a free rein, 
paying more attention to colored surfaces manipulated with a brush and a knife with great care to create transparency and overlaying effects. The closer I get to the great unity, the bigger and simpler my work must become. He wrote in a letter just before embarking on his last works. And it's true that there's something mysteriously cosmic about these paintings, something that might remind today's audience of Rothko. And this is undoubtedly due to those intimate and sometimes secret resonances, his unconscious sources, which mean to borrow Henri Fossillon's idea that in each work, we also see the energies of civilization converging. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today about Hodler. Thank you very much. <laughs>